winds coming in from the left. Top turn. Turn right and left. Assume to be right. right. To any authorities concerned, this is to inform you of illegal discharging of oily water from bilge tank, which happened last December 14th and 17th, 2009. The chief engineer instructed as to make a bypass flange to discharge oily water overboard. We are asking help to any authorities concerned about this because we must protect our environment and our marine lives. Sincerely yours, the engine department. This is an image that comes from a satellite. It shows a ship and it shows the path of oil behind that ship. Aerial surveillance shows an oil slick in the wake of a ship. This is side-looking airborne radar. Here's the ship, there's the oil. And lastly, that's oil streaking on the side of the ship, called a comet streak. This is evidence of a crime. The ship is underway, so only some of it sticks to the side of the ship. The rest of that oil is in the ocean. It's with the fish, it's with the seabirds, it's with the turtles, with the dolphins, the whales. Because water covers so much of the Earth, people have always thought of it as endless. But in fact, anything that gets into the ocean remains there. The Coast Guard estimates crude oil at the rate of 8,000 barrels a day could be spilling into the open sea. Now authorities are worried about an environmental catastrophe. BP Oil, which leases the platform, and the Coast Guard have at least 35 containment vessels dispatched to the More area. than 11 million gallons of crude oil poured into the sea. The tanker Exxon Valdez bound for California. Most people, when they think about the environment, they worry about the big accidents and forget that anywhere from a third to half of the oil that's in the ocean didn't come from these accidents. It came from the intentional release of oil by ships. Oil is toxic to organisms, and it can be toxic in several ways. This is a gross image. You know, when you coat something with oil like that, it's going to die. That's not what we're concerned with. We are concerned with what happens with those lesser concentrations that you can't see may have very big effects on developing organisms. That's the concern that we are faced with. This is a picture of pink salmon embryos that was exposed to a high concentration of oil and you can see the expansion of this area around the yolk sac. The toxins in oil, as you see here, can cause many of the same kinds of defects in uh, organism as are caused by oftentimes considered to be more serious uh, chemicals like those in PCBs and like dioxins. I think that as a society, we first became aware of oil pollution when there was a very large oil spill called the Torrey Canyon. And the Torrey Canyon was the biggest oil spill that we'd ever had. A tragedy such as Britain has never experienced before. Every tide left a thick covering of oil to which detergent was applied with all speed. With 50,000 tons of oil still on board, defiantly menacing the whole south coast of England, possibly even the coast of France. But now the decision was taken. The Torrey Canyon was to be bombed. For the pilots, it would be not target practice, but bombing for defense to save part of the country from a new menace. Essentially, we woke up to the fact that oil had a cost as well as a benefit. We suddenly realized this is an international problem. It's a problem that we can't deal with by just dealing with one country. It has to be an international treaty, and MARPOL was the response to that.
MARPOL is an international treaty whose purpose was the complete elimination of intentional pollution of the marine environment by oil and other harmful substances. This is a treaty that is successful in terms of the number of countries that have signed on, but in terms of enforcement and the level of violation, much less successful. Deliberate pollution from ships occurs every day. It's a virtual epidemic. International shipping is what makes modern commerce work in the world. So most of the corporate players, the individuals that are involved in international shipping fly, frankly, under the radar. The United States is clearly a world leader in enforcing MARPOL. You would think is the no-brainer is don't dump oil into the water. Unfortunately, uh, there are people out there that still illegally dump oil overboard. It's my job to stop it. I've been with the Coast Guard 17 and a half years now. We go out and do inspections every day. Good morning, Captain. Jim Carlin, United yeah. States Coast Guard. Yeah. Good morning, Captain. What we like to do from here, Captain, is uh, we'll do a, an examination down in the uh, engine oh, spaces. Okay. We'll actually go down and do a visual inspection of the equipment, and then we'll have them do an operational test. And that tells us whether or not they understand their equipment, they know how to use it, and if it's operating correctly. The inspectors are kind of like the workhorse. We understand the equipment, we understand the process, we understand the laws. We're making sure that they're in compliance with MARPOL. Large commercial vessels have waste oil. It's part of how they work. You can't just take that and dump it over side. That has to be put into a holding tank that will later be sent shoreside to a facility. Any overboard discharge has to be through a pollution prevention machine called an oily water separator. Once you get it up to speed, yeah. if you could just give me a minute to take a look around it before we put it in. Well, Marpole says if you're gonna dump oil, it has to run through filtering equipment, which won't allow more than 15 parts per million oil over the side of the ship. Oil becomes visible around 100 parts per million. If you can see oil in the water, if you can see an oil slick, you know that it's a violation of MARPOL. They were having a hard time getting that oily water separator going. It wasn't operating the way it should. Here we go. Okay. Restart that off. It's hit clear water. It's coming down. Other than finding that their equipment was having a hard time getting started, operating correctly, we went to check the alarms and sound system. So when that does fail, or when it does go above 15 parts per million and it shuts down, it gives the operating station an uh, alarm. And uh, the alarm wasn't working properly. Just too many red flags. So from there, we're going to start getting a little bit more involved with the process, and we're going to lead it to the district attorney so that this way we can uh, make sure there's no criminal activity going on. If a ship is unlawfully dumping, if they're putting their oil in the ocean and that ship comes to the United States, there are records aboard most ships that are going to allow criminal investigators to piece the crime together. This officer is going to review your chart and some other bridge items, and okay. I'm going to review the uh, oil record book. Okay. The oil record book that they maintain on board, it's really to show where oil's going from the time that they take it on board the vessel to the time it's off. It's like following the money. So we want to follow the oil. We want to make sure that every, just about every ounce of that oil is accounted for. Obviously, nobody's writing down, we're dumping overboard today. One of the early cases that I prosecuted was Royal Caribbean, one of the largest cruise ships in the world, cruise lines in the world. And the Norwegian engineers had a name for this book. They called it the Eventerbach which in Norwegian meant the fairy tale book, because it was a book of lies. It wasn't the book of the truth. And when you come to the United States, this is a condition of port entry. You can't have a ship that doesn't have this book. So if you come here 
and your oil record book has been falsified. It's missing all the overboard dumping. It doesn't have it in here. The people who are responsible for that will go to jail, and the company that's responsible for that is going to pay a huge fine. Right, it was over almost 12 hours. Oh, that was the stop time. Right, you start at 0835. Yes. Okay. And that was your stop. position at stop yes. time, right? Yes. Essentially, for us, if somebody comes across oily water, we could see if they pass in that area, if it's a possibility that they discharged oil. Every oil has a unique fingerprint. Right. If we match it up, it's prison time for someone. It's hard to think of any other industry where there's an environmental crime that's so prevalent, so common. On ships, there's often a culture that not anything that I could possibly do would injure the ocean. But we know that it does. Oil is widely distributed in the environment. But in the midwater, in the center of an ocean, you could expect the chemicals to be as low or perhaps lower than almost any other place on Earth. So what's happening in this area? And this, we are very interested in determining. If ships, for example, are passing over the center of the North Atlantic and should happen to discharge oil of some kind, some of it could fall through the midwater. So one could ask, do you fish in this midwater region? Can you tell me if you've been exposed? And lo and behold, most of them we looked at showed us a change that would suggest they have been exposed to some chemical. So now the question is, can there be bad effects as a result of the exposure for many kinds of chemicals, when they are taken into the body, the body has a way of reacting. And that reaction is by making more of the enzyme that will metabolize those chemicals. It happens largely as a way for the organism to protect itself. This enzyme is the principal one that is produced in response to exposure to oil. With an enzyme like this, things move in and out. Here the change would take place and that change can be carcinogenic. The irony is that the transformation of something like benzoapyrene by CYP1A is referred to as a double-edged sword. It cuts two ways. One is protection and the other is damage that can result from the metabolites produced. What's really becoming clear to scientists is that there is no place in the world now that is pristine because we are putting in every day toxins and oil and other pollutants into the water. Those are spreading throughout the oceans. So there's no pristine place left anymore. The problem with oil pollution that occurs continuously is that the organisms never have a chance to recover. The first birds are, are just starting to, about one yard out. Keep down. Just stay down. Everybody stay down. The bird just moved back to about uh, 20 yards or so from the catch area. Larry, some just come very close now. They're moving in. Okay, the net's in. Three, two, one, fire. Got the lock. Push, push, let's pull the projectile from behind you. Pull the projectile from behind you. Mod box! Absolutely bomb. We study the red knots because they're a vulnerable species. Their populations have declined dramatically in only 30 years. Is this a knot box? The numbers that used to go through Delaware Bay were over 100,000. And now there's maybe 15,000 to 20,000 going through Delaware Bay, and some people say it's even less than that. Red knots stop in Delaware Bay because it is the largest concentration of breeding horseshoe crabs on the East Coast. 
With every high tide, the horseshoe crabs come in and breed, lay eggs, and those eggs become available. Whenever the populations of any species decline dramatically, it indicates that there's some problem with the ecosystem. It's our task, really, to figure out why have they declined? In what place are they facing most threats? And what are those threats? This is new. The this capture was at 1630. Larry is the bander. So the red knot, although it's a bird that many people have never heard of before, it's an indicator of the health of the ecosystem. They might tell us something about whether the chronic oil that's in the water is causing a problem. They might tell us something about whether the food supply is okay. And ultimately, they tell us whether we need to be worried about the environment that we live in because we're part of that environment. But that's light. That's going to put a lot of weight on it. Well, yeah, it's almost got to double. Oh, yeah. That bird has to almost double before yeah. it's going to leave. Absolutely. Now, we've got to find out where that geolocator yeah. is. By putting those geolocators on the red knots, we are able to get a record of every place that bird has been in the year since we saw it last. We tagged the bird in Delaware Bay, which is right here. And from here, the bird went up to the Arctic, looked around for a place to breed. That's why it's not only in one place. And then it came back, went around a storm, all the way down to Cerro del Fuego, stopping only once. And then on its way back, it stopped once here and a couple times here to get back to Delaware Bay where we recaught it. If there was not enough food in Delaware Bay, in all likelihood, the birds would not gain enough weight to be able to successfully reach the Arctic. So they may either perish because they starve, or they may not be able to breed that year. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is considering to move it to a endangered status. We hope to have been out of this business by now. The Department of Justice, we've been prosecuting these cases for about 20 years now. And yet year after year after year after year, we continue to get criminal cases referred to us by the Coast Guard. From my experience, the most common form of cheating is uh, what we call a magic pipe. A magic pipe could be a hose, it could be a pipe, it could be a painted pipe that will transport oil directly from, say, a holding tank or a bilge, right around the oily water separating equipment, right into the ocean. That magic item that we find at uh huh, we gotcha. This is what's called a magic pipe. That is a term of art that somehow has arisen in the industry, and I think the reason, originally, at least I've been told, is because the oil magically disappears. In any criminal enterprise, somebody who's breaking the law is doing math. It's a calculation, right? Chance I'm going to get caught, chance I'm not going to get caught. People are still making the calculation that this crime is sometimes worth it. In environmental crimes cases, we don't have to prove motive, don't have to prove why somebody did it, but it is what every juror and every judge wants to know. From my experience, the motivation out there uh, to pump oil in the water um, comes from greed. It's always about money. Follow the money. The United States is the only country that has a whistleblower award. On a ship, it's a small space, and people know what's taking place in that space. Fabrication of pipe connected to overboard as per instruction of first engineer. The OSG case began with a foreign referral. Canada suspected that this ship was dumping, and they were right. But in our investigation, one ship led to another ship to another ship, and 12 OSG ships were found to be involved in illegal conduct. To have a company this large, a publicly traded company, a company headquartered in the United States of America, engaged in this type of criminal conduct was shocking to us. Once the investigation began, 
we interviewed crew members on the ship. And one of those crew members came forward and he had tucked underneath his arm a little black notebook. He was the fitter of the ship and he was asked to build a bypass system. He was so angry about having to make the pipe, he recorded every time that they dumped overboard. Before we left in Port of Boston, around 4 to 5 p.m., I started pumping out the slop from the tank in which the said action is against Marple. And he received over $400,000 in the case. This was a case that resulted in a $37 million penalty. We certainly hope we are sending a message to mariners and to the industry that this crime is taken very seriously in the United States. If you like prison, go ahead and dump oil in the water. If you don't like prison, don't do it. I think what this shows is that it's a small world out there. If you're dumping on the high seas, if you're dumping in another country's waters, there are ways for us to find out. At the same time, we're prosecuting only the tip of the iceberg, only the tip. The problem is greater than we know, and we know it's a great big problem. We may think we're the most important link, but in fact, we're only one link in a very large, interconnected ecosystem. If the ecosystems around us that we care about are gonna survive in this world, we have to start stopping the things that we can stop. Dumping a little bit of oil in the ocean may not seem like much to them, but when all the ships are dumping a little bit of oil, it adds up and we need to stop that. Help us to prosecute these cases. Help us to stop this crime. Help us to protect the world's oceans. Mm -hmm.